there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. I'm Siobhan Rurokiri, and I have a friend, a very, very dear friend called Helena McAlpine. So what can I tell you about Helena? Okay, one thing, this woman has always lived her life in the fast lane. I mean the very fast lane. And when she was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer, well, you know what? It hasn't slowed her down one little bit. She is relentlessly upbeat and just really determined to face this, this illness with courage and just the most amazing positivity. This is my friend Helena. Oh God, it's hot. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I feel alive. <laughs> and I'm going to live for as long as I possibly can. <laughs> I know that scientifically there is no way of curing me. But I am not going to stop living in order to hurry up and die. I was in the shower getting ready one morning and brushed my hand over my breast and it's the strangest thing. You think that's not part of me, where did that come from? And I looked down and you could see this lump is physically sticking out from my skin by a good half an inch and it was huge. I don't know if you're around, of course, the first thing you think is cancer, but this thing was so comically large, and I was 31. And you think, nah, too young, too big, it's a cyst. It's, it's quite huge. It's a huge <laughs> lump. So yeah, it was cancer, and there were two massive lumps, actually, and there one further inside my breast. I didn't even notice, how bad was that? Yeah. I got taken in to have my left breast removed. Completely removed, nipple and all. And the second night of being in hospital, I snuck out through a window. I put pillows in the bed <laughs> and I unhooked myself from the drift. I climbed out the window and we drove over to the North Shore in Auckland and we lit off fireworks and then I went back again. <laughs> and then um, in the December, I started chemotherapy. I thought I was going to be feeling very sick and very tired, and yeah, that certainly happened. But everybody bought cakes, and we'd have tea, and we would sit around and tell each other stories, and I, I, I actually really enjoyed it. Can I do? And then we started um, radiotherapy, and I found that very difficult. It was 15 weeks of every single day of going there and thinking about what was happening to me. I just couldn't wait for it to be over. The moment that my, my therapy stopped, I just went kind of crazy and just really lived life hard. And, you know, I, I had a great time. It was brilliant. There was plenty of us that, that were sort of aware that she wasn't doing all that she could, but she is so good at going, oh, yeah, I've done this and I've, and I've done that, and she hadn't. And I think that she was just in denial and just wanted her life back, and that was something that she dealt, dealt with and pushed aside. I didn't go to a lot of my um, doctor's appointments and I didn't take the uh, medication I was supposed to have taken. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm sort of paying for that now. Although my doctors will tell you um, it was just a, a really good chance that I was going to have more cancer. Um, I think we all know that I'm to blame for um, not looking after myself properly. Yeah. I spent Christmas and New Year's of um, 2011, 2012 with my parents in London, and it was wonderful. And I can remember on Boxing Day, having a bit of a scratch, finding another lump, this time in my right breast. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? 
but I didn't say anything to my mum and dad. I wanted to wait until I got back to New Zealand. So I came back, had some more tests done. Yes, it's breast cancer again. And I was like, oh, all right, OK, well, we know how this plays out, so let's just get this over and done with. We had a few more tests done, and I got called back to the doctor's office, and he said, I'm so sorry, it's, it's, it's in your liver as well. And I said, well, how difficult is that? Get me a new liver or cut a bit of this one out, you know? Give me some more medicine, it'll be fine. And he explained to me that that's not how it works. Secondary breast cancer in the liver is incurable, which means that it's terminal, which means that I will eventually die because of that cancer. And needless to say, I was pretty shocked. Um, I have always thought that I was invincible, but um, this time round, I wasn't. But there is an awful lot that I can do. They took out my ovaries to stop the hormones from being produced that feed the cancer. They said, oh, well, yeah, this basically gives you one to three years. The work, the, the... I feel bad for Shannon. I feel bad for Shannon. Um, no regrets for my, my, myself, but I do feel bad that Shannon's going to be without a mother and knowing that I'm going to be leaving my daughter too early, yeah, sucks. I want to have a statue made of myself. Very good. Like, oh, why not? What, naked or clothed? Does it matter? <laughs> I have a bucket <laughs> list. Um, it's a list that you create of amazing things that you want to achieve before you die. So one weekend I was supposed to be swimming with sharks, but I ended up filming a part on Shortland Street. I was ambulance officer number one. This is Kirsten Ryden Pillion, GCS 14. Right compound fracture, tib fib, right wrist injury. Heart rate 96. Cubicle two. One of the things I first saw was that I need to eat lots of pickled onions. So I went to the shop and I bought a big jar of pickled onions and uh, I thought, well, that's one thing ticked off. I don't know how much time she's got left, but she will be able to cram 99.9% .9 of it in. And the way she does things, she will do it. She makes people do it <laughs> and make it happen. So it's all good. I'm just warming you up on a little one first. She's been yeah. really brave in, in the way that no one knows how they'd cope with it unless they were faced with it themselves. But for her to scrawl a great big bucket list and stick it on the fridge and go, right, this is what I want to do, and I want to do this and do that, and she's actively getting out there and doing it. I, I feel like Keisha Castle Hughes, um, but instead of the whale, it's a shark. She is wringing absolutely everything out of her life. Give him a little guide out. <laughs> that felt amazing. <laughs> That's the best bit. Wow. I'm from London, North West London. I was born and raised in Kilburn and then Wembley. A month before my 22nd birthday, I, I had Shannon. But two months into her being alive, her dad decided that it was just all a bit too much and sort of up and left. Um, and I went to work at British Telecom where I met Brett McAlpine, this amazing little Kiwi man with the most beautiful green eyes. And we, um, we fell in love and got married about a year later. And then, yeah, shifted over to New Zealand and you couldn't get me out of this country for love nor money now. <laughs> I'm very lucky to have found him. Hiya. <coughs> I think there's a um, hairbrush in the bedroom. I'll go and use it, please. <sighs> Brett and I didn't last. And when we um, broke up and I moved into town, um, it was a sort of organic decision to have Shannon stay with Brett, live with Brett. She loves Brett and he's a good parent. So much better than I could ever, ever actually be. Who's that with the crocodile? I do love my child, but um, I'm just not a very maternal person, I suppose. Um, and as it's turned out, best decision that we ever made. Let's talk about your hair. Oh, go away. Why? Let's talk about your hair. I thought she did an okay job. It's a bit so red. Right. When I was in England, when I was growing up in England, I would have loved to have been encouraged to do more acting or, you know, more of the arts. But my parents were always very much, hey, nose down, arse up, get a nine to five. 
So when I moved to New Zealand and accidentally tripped and fell into radio and then television, I suppose I was just really lucky. Now, I've managed to find myself a group of portalies here, but there is a bit of a queue. One day I got a phone call asking if I would try out for C4. And for some reason they asked me to be on on non-special features. They gave me my own television show. This is a technique I like to call the dance and glides. I did that for a year and it was amazing, so yeah. More than I could ever have ever have hoped for. And she's actually on her third album as well. Now, ow! <laughs> I got made redundant from C4 in January of 2009, which was poo. That was really crap. But then um, my boyfriend of the time decided that, um, oh, and he left, and I lost a lot of money in a pretty bad investment, so that sucked. And then my dog got hit by a car, and we had to put her down. And that was pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back. Aside from always having um, a few mental health issues, you know, I've been diagnosed with um, bipolar, um, manic depression and um, ADHD. That year really tested me, pushed a few buttons, and I didn't leave the house for three months. There was a suicide attempt and there were plenty of times when I had drunk myself into such a state that, um, yeah, I could have ended up very, very dead. When I came out of that, it was like being filled up with life again. And I can remember coming out of it, it was like the, the light at the end of the tunnel, and it was like being reborn. It was utterly amazing. And I can remember being held by a darling friend of mine and just crying because I was so grateful for being alive. And it wasn't very long after that that we found out about cancer. And I thought, really? <laughs> really? Um, but, you know, cancer was tangible. It was a lump. You could physically feel it. Depression and being that unhappy, you, you can't physically touch it and cut it out or get rid of it. Um, and I was, always thought if I could get through that depression, I could do anything. Good boy. Come on, then. The whole um, McAlpine theory on life, <laughs> it really did stem from that um, moment of um, pretty bad depression. Always be grateful. Be grateful for what you have, what you have had and what you're going to have in the future. And um, choose the path of least resistance. Choose to be happy. Even now, being told that I'm um, terminally sick, apparently. Um, we, we know that, that to be the truth, but I, I, I really don't think of my life as being a sack of sadness. You have this preconception of what a cancer sufferer goes through because you've either, either seen it in someone else or you see it on TV and it's a frail, sick person who can't be in a room with germs or anything else. And then, and then you've got Elena, <laughs> who you and others have to keep reminding is sick is terminally sick. And it's really hard because it's so easy to get caught up in her fun and, and she's so full of life. And then you have to step back and go, hang on, no, she's she's got a full stop at the end of her sentence and we're, we're walking towards it. I just get too excited. She just looks upon life like, oh, throw it at me, I'll take it. I'll just throw it back at you, right slap in the face. And um, I think what she's doing and how she gets out there and looks upon life with everything that she's had to deal with is totally brilliant and amazing. It's the choices that we make and I choose to take this hand that I've been dealt and make the absolute best of it. I do try to absorb Helena's um, attitude towards the whole thing, but I am so different to her, it's, it's really hard for me. And, yeah, we, um, we do count the days. And last year, when, when it was her birthday and she was 34, we were sort of talking about her birthday and it was all going swimmingly until she just turned around and said, oh, I've made it to my 34th birthday, Mummy. And I thought, well, that's just, that's just amazing. Are we going to get to the 35th? Who knows? And, yeah, it's, it's hard for me, really hard for me. 
And my daughter, she really, really wants to have her hair cut off when I lost my hair. I want an undercut like you did. Let's shave all my hair off. And I, one day, she was bugging me. I was like, well, just go and get a pair of scissors right now. And she came back with the kitchen scissors, and I just packed this load off and looked at her and went, oh, I'm so sorry, that does not look good. When I was first diagnosed in 2009, the third phone call I made was to the New Zealand Breast Cancer Foundation. And I just picked up the phone and I said, I have just been told I've got breast cancer. What can you do to help me and what on earth can I do to help you? Before I die, I want to get a message out to every woman in the country, reminding them that they are precious and irreplaceable and making sure they have the information they need to stay healthy. I'm sick and tired of hearing that seven Kiwi women every day are diagnosed with breast cancer, that over 600 women a year die from this disease, and an alarming amount of them are young like me. This is not our mother's disease. It's not our grandmother's disease. I was 31. I thought I was young, and yet I had met women in their mid-20s, their 20s, dying of breast cancer. Early detection will be the number one way of preventing death from breast cancer, that's my ultimate goal. Because I'm so passionate about this message, people say to me, well, what did you do? You put your head in the sand. And yeah, I did, and as a result, I am now qualified to tell you exactly what I've learned. I'm not saying these things because it's something I've read in a book or I think that it sounds really, you know, clever. I'm saying it from experience. Learn from my mistakes. Don't be an idiot like I am. Look after yourselves. It's really simple. Make the right choice. So, the end of 2012, and I decided to leave Auckland and move to Gisborne. But before I left, my friends pulled off the surprise party of the century without me having the slightest idea. I got told that I was going to be emceeing um, a new product launch for L'Oreal. This has not got stuff all to do with L'Oreal. This has got everything to do with you. And tonight, Helena McAlpine, this is a celebration of you! I'm talking a thousand people at Vector Arena with bands and DJs and what? It was mind-blowing. It was so emotionally overwhelming. How humble, how special does, can one girl feel? Um, smothered in love. Smothered in love. Um, the McAlpine doesn't cry, but yes, I did have a, a good old sob during that particular incident. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Helena's living on and off with my parents in Gisborne now by removing herself from a place full of temptation like Auckland and going to nice, sleepy old Gisborne. That's, that's a really good thing for her to do. There's this, definitely a sense of peace in Gisborne that resonates with what's inside me. Um, I do enjoy spending time by myself. I do enjoy sitting quietly and reading and I enjoy um, being closer to nature. Take a deep breath. Good work. This is a good colour on you, by the way. <laughs> There's no denying that my body is um, slowly giving up on me. You know, there's, there's more pain every day. I get very tired, really, really tired. And this chemo isn't just for my liver. It's because the cancer spread. And we're targeting the bones now and the lining of the abdominal cavity and hopefully going to eradicate all of that and give me some more time. I get sad when I think about the fact that at one point I'm going to close my eyes and I'm never going to open them again. And I do think about what that's going to feel like and what is, 
what is the last thing I actually want to see before I close my eyes for that last time. I don't know exactly what the image is going to be. It will be my daughter standing in front of a tree. That's, I want to die outside and I want that to be the last thing I see. Um, but I'm not scared, I'm not scared. When you get told she's got one, two, three years or something, my way of dealing with it is I just block it out. And I'm like, no, no, it's... It's, 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 it's not going to happen. <laughs> my sister's going to stay with me and... When she said to me, oh, come move out here, come move out here, I was like, but you're just not going to be here. I, I, I'm struggling to put into words how I'm going to feel when, when she's not around because I'm refusing to, I guess, let myself live, live uh, in, in, that, in that world at the moment. It, yeah, see? Look what it's doing to me. And I, you know, and she'd hate that. She wouldn't want that. She, she hates seeing us upset. Um, and so, why upset her? Why not just go skateboarding? Right. I don't want to be remembered as the girl with cancer. I want to be remembered as being a mom to a great kid. Oh, my God. I want to be remembered as being a good friend. I want to be remembered as being a loving, caring daughter and hopefully, you know, a, a great sister and... Um, I want to be remembered for all of those things. <laughs> it's constantly um, on my shoulder, being alive probably dying soon. Um, and I don't think of it... I don't think of it as anything other than the inevitable. But it doesn't have to be just yet, you know? Um, and I'm much more interested in the... What can we do right now? Let's go and blow something up. Let's go swim with some sharks. Let's go jump out of a plane. See if we bounce. Um, it doesn't, yeah. I, I, I don't know. You just breathe every day and get on with it.